Well, hello, welcome. Thank you for coming here Then the first talk of the day. Um, we are going to talk about building a secure pipeline. Uh, I really meant to put the word AppSec in front of pipeline, so that's why I have the parenthetical uh, phrase after, underneath it. Uh, that was my bad. Because um, this is really about how to do taking the DevOps and Agile and the things that have worked really well for dev and in some cases infrastructure, particularly if you're doing infrastructure as code, those things that worked well for those groups and making them work well for AppSec teams. So. So I'm Aaron Weaver. Uh, I've been in security for like, over a decade. I don't know that's long. A, a long time. A long time. Uh, and I've worked at uh, several organizations. Uh, one of the things that excites me about this talk is that uh, this is, I think, going to be my third time at an organization to do an application security pipeline. Um, beyond just uh, security, I love to uh, roast coffee, and uh, I love to do woodworking. So if there's any woodworkers or coffee roasters out there, I'd love to chat about that at some point. And be careful hanging out with him, because you'll start roasting, because I did after I met him. <laughs> and now I'm a coffee snob. It's, it's, it's a good and a bad thing. And I'm Matt Tassaro. And like Aaron was saying, we did this together at Pearson several years ago for the first sort of iteration of this. This is where the idea came from. And I really think it really, really worked for us. And I really think the industry should look at this as a source of ideas and a way to make them, their jobs as AppSec professionals much better. And we started the AppSec pipeline pro, uh, pro, uh, project rather at OWASP because we realized there's a bunch of good stuff at OWASP, but there really wasn't something for internal people running teams. And so we're trying to make the AppSec pipeline play, uh, program be, or project, be a way that people that are running a, an AppSec team, or maybe you're a team of one, which has happened to all of us, um, help make your life a little bit better by gathering resources and bringing things together. So I want to talk about the evolution of AppSec and how I think um, we can evolve from where we are now to where I believe we need to be. And I want to start by talking about trains, which kind of seems weird, although there is this whole MIT uh, Lincoln Lab and train thing. There's this weird thing with, with early computer people and trains. I'm not into trains personally, but I want to talk about trains, because trains, besides the whole steam engine revolution, trains, particularly in the US, really made a radical change, right? We went from being kind of on the East Coast, where the Brits and et cetera landed and, and poked into the, the new world, air quotes, right? But when we got trains, we suddenly can go from east to west coast. And America became kind of one big country because of trains, right? So if you look at trains, right? Travel time before a train was six months. And in a wagon and, you know, maybe full of Indian arrows, who knows, right? But it was a pretty arduous journey. You didn't lightly decide to go across the US. That was kind of like, we're making this bold move and we're going to strike out, right? I'm going to go west. And it was, a, it was an adventure. It was exciting. It was potentially dangerous. After we had the International Intercontinental inter, uh, Railroad, it went to a week. And a week is not much time in the 1800s. That's, that's a silly fast. And it was 150 versus $1,800, right? That is an amazing drop in price. It radically changed how travel happened in the US. Um, and if you didn't, by the way, have a train stop by you, more than likely, if you didn't have a train stop at your town, more than likely your town died out, or it certainly was hurt, and didn't, couldn't perform as well economically without the train going by. There were many towns that the train decided to not stop at, and they just kind of withered away and died. So let's look about trains and change, right? It changed the landscape, for better or worse. I'll let the historians argue about that. I'm not a historian, I'm a geek. Um, but definitely the US got smaller, right? This big, huge continent that was six months and scary and wagon wheels and no roads to get across suddenly became a one week journey and a reasonable amount of money, right? That was a huge revolutionary change. And it expanded markets, right? If you made something on the East Coast, you could ship it reasonably to the West Coast, particularly if it wasn't a perishable good, right? This became very easy to do. Before you had to put it on a wagon and had to make it all the way six months later, who knows? Right? And certainly the cost of going west went way down, from 1,000 to 150. That was a huge radical change. Well, let's look at this. DevOps, I think, changed as changing or has changed IT for better or worse. Certainly small batch size 
and change size got smaller with CI/CD, fundamental principle of DevOps. We have increased agility and more customers because now we can do those experiments and they're cheap, and the cost of experiments goes way down. When you can write code, push it to the GitHub, and it goes into a production or pre-prod, depending on how you want to work things, your cost of experimentation goes way down. It's not a six-month rollout with a change control window and gating and all the other hoo-ha that traditionally happen in software, right? This is the same kind of speed up that AppSec needs. So I'm really waiting to see when AppSec will give the love to DevOps and bring some of these principles in, because I think this needs to happen. We need to meet in the middle somewhere, like, kind of like the transcontinental, was that Promontory Point, I think, where they put in the final stake of the transcontinental railroad, and luckily they weren't off. That, that would have been really hilarious. Like suddenly this big curve right before the end. Um, but we really need to get together and meet, have a meeting of the minds. So let's talk about uh, pipelines, and particularly AppSec pipelines. And I've had some confusion when I've given these talks before where people come in thinking I'm talking about you have CICD, how do you add security to it? And that's cool, but that's honestly not where we started. We started with let's make a pipeline, and that pipeline delivery is an, uh, the artifact or the output of that pipeline isn't a deployment or a built piece of code, it's security artifacts, right? It's results, it's reports, it's bugs, uh, submitted to a project or an application or what have you, right? So we're making a pipeline not to build or deploy code, we're making a pipeline to build or deploy the output of a security team, i.e., what's the security state of this, our, our suite of uh, applications? So let's talk about AppSec pipelines. And like I said, I, I completely stole the idea of pipelines from CICD because I think it just works. And what, what is it, if you're going to do an AppSec pipeline, what are the key features? What are the things that make it unique? You have to design it for iterative improvement because prob most likely none of the people in this room were hired to be pipeline builders. You were hired to be AppSec professionals, right? So you have to sort of fit this around the day job in essence, carve out some time to do this, and you're never gonna have the, hey, I need to go idle for six weeks and build this thing, right? You're gonna have to build it in pieces over time. Um, the nice thing is once you get the set, there's a reusable path for AppSec, and you start to have a common language amongst the team and amongst your constituencies about how things are going and where they are in the phase of a request coming in to results going out. Um, and there's a one-way flow with well-defined states. Like you're, you've put in a request, I've had your request, now you're going to DAST or SAS testing. Okay, your results are in the vulnerability database, now here's your reporting in JIRA or whatever bug tracker you want et cetera, right? We have well-defined states as they flow from left to right. Um, and the, probably the biggest thing is it has to gracefully interconnect with whatever your developers are doing in terms of how they handle bugs, right? If, if you're not putting security findings into whatever bug tracker your developers use, you might as well be speaking French to people who only speak English, right? Like they don't wanna see a 300-page PDF. I want 300-page PDFs to die and go to bed forever. I never want to see them again. I don't want to produce them. I've produced hundreds of them, and it's awful. Um, so I'm a, I'm a reformed PDF producer. Um, but it really does need to gracefully interconnect with the, with the dev teams. So let's look at a pipeline. So when Aaron and I were at Pearson and we were trying to figure out our situation, that was what it was. How many developers do we have? It was like 12, 1,500? 12, 1,500 developers. There was eight of us, do it right? Eight of us in the AppSec team and about 2,000 apps, but like that number was, some people say we have 1,000, some people say we have 2,500. Nobody really freaking knew. We had a whole bunch of apps, some thousands of apps. So we sat down and looked at like, what do we have to do to do an assessment or understand the, the security posture of an application? And so we started on the far side with requests coming in or us understanding there's an app that needs to be assessed. That's the intake portion, right? We intake those and then the triage, idea, the idea with the triage position is, I've got this request coming into our group, I need to understand more or less how much love I need to give this app, right? If it's a low risk, low use, internal only, and the risk prof profile of it is very low, I don't wanna give it a lot of my resources, honestly. I wanna maybe just do a best effort on that guy. But if it's a high profile, high risk, key app for the business, you better believe it's gonna get the full Monty, right? So triage is where you kind of decide how much of the pipeline this application needs to go through. Testing phase is a way that we can a la carte handle testing. 
This can be threat modeling, dynamic, static, whatever, manual, what have you. All that happens in the middle of the test position. The key thing is that all of those tests need to output in a format that can be put into a vulnerability management database where you normalize and gather those together and you have one source of truth for the vulnerabilities in your AppSec program. Um, and then from there, since it's normalized data, you can pull out reports. You can push it into your GRC system. You can push things into JIRA. You can use this to filter out false positives before they get pushed into JIRA, right? And so having those things, uh, what am I, I wanna say stuck together, but I wanna find a better word, but I'm just gonna say stuck together in the vulnerability uh, management database allows you to do reporting and stuff in one sane way. I don't have to report one way for my static, one way for my dynamic, one way for my manual. All the tests and the reporting comes out the same. And it's great, it's super crazy fantastic for metrics. I just had that question Yeah. Our, our entire goal there was to stop looking at the vendor tools uh, as our you know, primary source. I, I really wanted them to be swappable and have an abstraction layer in front of it. And that was my entire goal because, um, and I, I know I've said this before, but respectfully though, I mean, some of these tools are great and then they become less great. Uh, <laughs> usually when you get them up. Right. And so I, I want to be able to swap out any of these tools. And you know, my end vision was, okay, let's look at a repository. Let's, we know the language, languages that are used for a particular uh, repo. And then let's be able to run a suite of tools against those. And if we're throwing them into one, one centralized database, we will be able to then normalize those and then spit them out. Um, and, and that was, to me, our, pretty much a lot of our goal. Even like so, a lot of these tools too don't even have great APIs. But if we front end them, right, then we're able to uh, take those results and we're able to actually run them and then push them into the same, same spot. Because there's a lot of really awesome command line tools out there, um, but then I don't want to be running those ad hoc. So that was our goal, is to get these into one place. And maybe some questions are, has it looked different from you know, one organization to the next? And I say, yes, it has. Um, I know that I have swapped out lots of those middle part tools. I've even swapped out my source of truth yep. several times, not because I've actually wanted to and not because I'm just like a squirrel or, you know, hey, look, there's another tool out there. Um, <laughs> but trying to find the right tool to do the right job. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about it later, too, is in some, in some cases we're just writing blue code to make these things work, work better. Um, for, for me and for us, right, it was let's make the developers, the less, the less friction, the better, which is really obvious, but our developers have been bit by our bad security tools, um, providing findings that just don't exist or that are not important, and we're wasting time on these types of things. So that's where we're trying to get to. Right, and we did. We switched out the, our DAS provider in the middle of this at, at Pearson, and it was no big deal because there was an interface going in, there was an interface going out, and as long as we could write glue code to match those, but by you, hello, new one, done. That's a great point, thank you for that. <clears throat> ah, so what do we want is an a la carte selection of choices, but with, uh, or we want a la carte when you come in in terms of how you're gonna assess, but we need a, a reasonable number of choices, right? So it's sort of like you have the best analogy ever. You go to Chipotle or, or what have you, right? You can get a burrito or a bowl but they only have so three things of meat and they have some cheese and they have sour cream and they have, right? So it is a burrito built your way, but you minimize the number of choices. Um, and in the case of an AppSec pipeline, you ideally tailor those choices to the risk profile of the app. So the ones that are more risky get more loving and the ones that are less risky get less loving just because it's, you have limited resources. So what color is your pipeline? as we sort of went through several iterations. I'm gonna talk about what, what we are sort of calling Gen 1 pipelines, um, which is looking at, this is straight out of, I believe, uh, the DevOps handbook, look at your team's purpose, or at least inspired by, look at your team's purpose and the processes which aid that. So for us, oh, I, got, I have to, this is a mandatory quote for me, this Debbing quote, right? Spending time optimizing anything other than the critical resource is an illusion, and that's a really fundamental principle, right? If you've got a pipeline and you're fixing things down here, but it's slow up here, it doesn't matter how fast this one is. You're never gonna fill the pipe before this one. You gotta fix the early one. Um, so you have to spend a little bit of time thinking about for your team and your resources and what you can do, 
what's critical. In my opinion, the critical resources is the AppSec team. Like, please raise your hand if you have too many people on your AppSec team. Oh, shockingly, once again, no hands raised. Like, I'm never gonna have a hand raised. I've never had a team that was big enough. So the idea when we first started doing this pipeline was, there's eight of us and there's 1,000, 2,000 developers. How can we make, make the work that each one of us has to do be that much more effective? So we automated things that don't require a human brain. Like setting up a DAST scanner really doesn't require a human brain, right? You need a URL, you need creds. You can usually, if you have a decent API on the thing, you can send those in via an API. Maybe you have a few pages you don't want it to hit that can also be sent in via an API. Like you don't need a human brain to do that stuff. Why don't we automate that, right? When you automate those non-human brain things, you radically drive up consistency, right? Because now the setup for, let's say, your DAST is the same for every DAST once you provide those baseline details, right? Done. Uh, the really nice thing is we had crazy good tracking of status of things, which I've never had before. This is the first time in my 15 years of being in AppSec that I actually knew kind of where everything was because we had these well-defined states. It was really easy to track where things fell. And we had radical increase, and we'll talk about it at the end, of flow through the system. Um, and the nice thing is it really increased our visibility and metrics, because now we could say, you know what, I know that an app about this big, because I've been in the industry for a while, is gonna take three days maybe, but now we had numbers. A DAS thing takes this long, a SAS thing takes this long, a manual thing takes this long, and we have numbers behind that, not just like from the hip industry exp uh, experience talking, but actual real numbers. Um, and we definitely reduced dev, uh, friction because we started just pushing things directly into the bug tracker, which was huge. So here's this, this looks rather like the last slide I showed you, but this was our first iteration and really what we were focused on was making our team as efficient as possible. It was very inwardly focused. This really, because I've had a lot of questions when I've done these talks before, well how did you connect to the CICD or the other people? And for our iteration one, honestly I didn't care what the other people were doing. I needed our house to be in order first, and once that's in order and we're really moving fast, then we can start taking on these external dependencies, in essence, by talking to other dev teams and bringing them on board and being quick about it. Because the last thing you want to do is convince someone to allow you to be in their CI CD pipeline and then make a mess of it, right? So get your house in order, which we did with the sort of Gen 1 pipeline, and then look outside. Uh, yeah. The second place that I am So obviously it's like, look, I can find bugs all day, but if I don't have a well-defined process, and I know it makes sense, but if I don't have a well-defined process, why am I even bothering with this? So, you know, we know there's web app bugs out there, we know there's all these things out there. So I actually spent a good deal of time at the next place. I was like, look, this is how it's gonna look, here's how I'm gonna map it out, and we spent time doing that. Now, a lot of times in finding that, we're using a lot of similar tools. So, you know, you're finding Jira, you're finding Stash, um, you're finding GitHub. So in some places, in some cases, I'm just able to do drop into the next place that I go to, and then just run from there. Um, but but I found that it worked. I've had people ask and say, "Hey, will it work for my organization?" And I'm like, "Yeah, absolutely, it will, because it's abstract enough that it really can plug in anywhere. You know, it's not like it, we're not telling you which tools to run here. It, it's just more of a methodology." Well, and, and we've. Yeah, and we've changed the way we presented this because at the, when we initially presented this, we said this is how we did it. And I had many, many people saying, so I have to go get this piece of software to do this. I'm like, no, like, please don't. <laughs> get the software that works for you. Like, we, at Pearson, we had Service Desk. And if that's run well, um, that would have been a great thing to do intake. Uh, that was not the case particularly at Pearson. And we didn't use Service Desk, right? I had somebody in a training I did about this who said, we have Service Desk and we have great admins and it's super easy to use and the whole company uses it. I'm like, well, what the hell? Use it, like, come on, right? This, this is, it's, it's, it's why well, this talk is very interesting to me and kind of tricky because I, I don't want to be prescriptive. It's much more of a, this is a general idea and if you keep these concepts in mind as you make choices, as you're laying out your pipeline, you'll be in a much better place. But you're right, it's very, it's very custom. So once your house is in order, right, Look outside your team's purpose. And this is where you're reaching out to dev teams that are doing CI, CD, or that have some kind of automation. Because now your internal processes are saying you can actually reach out and integrate with others. So the traditional idea would be stick something like Gauntlet or Dependency Check or what have you, right, in somebody's CI, CD, and just write a little bit of glue code enough to ship it into your pipeline, right? Now you have external people's processes dropping into your pipeline and adding 
to your uh, ability to see the state of the security of your group. In Pearson, I forget what outside, some other group had a copy of a, shoot, the uh, WAS, the dynamic SAS scanner from the people who I think of as, uh, anyway, somebody else had a, a dynamic SAS scanner uh, that wasn't even in the security group. I've, uh, and we said, you know what, you've got that, that's great, can you feed us results? And we took the results and added them in there because it just gave us yet another view of um, what was going on in this, the whole suite of things that we were in charge of looking over. And so this ability to sort of be able to just plug in, and if you do this right, it's a REST request, right? And that's pretty dang easy. So you finish a result, you send a request in, and done, right? You can also do things like have webhooks happen to cause actions when a, when a scan fires. Ah, and then the other side of it is weaponizing Jenkins, right? And this is a case where if you are weaponizing Jenkins, my advice to you would be treat false positives like anaphylactic shock. Like treat it like if you're very, very, very allergic to bee stings, a false positive is getting stung by like 50 bees, right? It will kill you. And it will get you booted out of the pipeline really quick if you break the build for a false positive. Like you might as well just not go to work for the next week or more because no one's gonna trust you. And there's already not good trust usually between dev and security teams. So actually treating, giving them non-actionable results is really not helping you. So make sure that whatever test you do, it is ridiculously accurate. I would give up doing a test in a CICD if I had any kind of idea that it was gonna have false positives with any high amount, right? It just doesn't make sense. Particularly if you're in a build-breaking CICD case, right? Things like SSL cipher checks, well, those are very determined, I mean, it's very determinate, right? You can know, they have TLS2, here's a suite, they don't have these ones, right? Those are tests you can put because the false positives really aren't there. Do they have the right security headers? Those are also simple tests you can make that are very, very accurate. And then think about them between health checks and scanner items. And this is another one where the health checky kind of things, and once again, headers, and kind of normal, do they have the HTTP only on the cookie? These are very sort of baseline security items. Those can easily be run all the time, particularly if you're running your own Jenkins, because that's another fun thing. Sometimes you, you don't have access to Jenkins, you have to run your own depending on political environments. Um, but the idea of changing the idea of taking those things that would normally be part of a large uh, scanner, a, particularly a DAST scanner run, and cherry picking out the ones that you can do all the time and then just run them every day, every week, depending on how long it takes and what your cadence is, run them regularly and just consider them as health checks. Well, one of the, it sounds like a silly thing to do with maybe you've done too, is where we did, uh, can you log in with a password? Oh yeah. And, and, and that one actually came to me because of Dropbox, it was like four, four years ago, where they accidentally commented out and they promoted it to production. So I mean, even like silly little tests like that can be very useful, I mean that should never, should never. Should never be, yeah, should never be green. <laughs> yep, and then, if you have a, a, probably a more sophisticated group or a more uh, well, programmy kind of AppSec team, right? Um, you can take specific issues, write a very narrow defined test, drop that into your CI CD, and let Jenkins run it regularly, and then you'll know when the thing gets fixed. And so you can actually take an, a, a finding of something like there's cross-site scripting in the login page, just picking stuff out of the wind, write a simple test for that, right? That's a little bit of Python or Ruby or pick your language, it's nothing, you know, whatever you wanna do to make a request and see if I can cross-site script it. Um, put that as CICD, run that, and you will know the minute it gets fixed, right? You can get a ping, in essence, from your Jenkins box that says, hey, this cross-site scripting thing is no longer there. And you can actually, you had this, where you told a dev team, hey, that last release fixed this bug. Which, when does that happen? Like, never? That was really cool. And then cadence is another interesting problem. You have to think about how long tests take and whether or not they're worth doing sort of a build-breaking CI, CD or outside of that process. So for the longer running tests, and we had this really bad at Rackspace, we had lots of really nimble teams, there were certain tests that just took too long to run and we couldn't make them quicker, so we just ran them every week. And you know what? Maybe they had 10 or 15 pushes to production in between that week that I'm scanning, and that's okay because once I find it, guess what? They're gonna fix it really quick. So yes, maybe my, I'm not testing every release, but I'm testing every five or 10 releases. That's certainly better than testing every month or something like that, right? So there's this, depending on how fast your teams are going and how fast the tool will run or your test will run, you have to sort of pick these cadence issues. 
And I, I wish I was good enough at math to give you this magical formula. There isn't one, just use your best judgment. Um, that's certainly a case where you have to sort of look at test, and it's really about taking the things that we would normally think of as the big scanner run and making them bits. Right? Break them up into individual tests and pull out as many of those as you can and run them individually, and that'll save you time. The other thing is, if you're really clever, all those things that you pull out as health checks, turn them off in your DAST scanners. Right? If you're already checking SSL every day via Jenkins, turn that test off on your DAST scanner. Why do you need that again? Why check it twice? Right? So you can actually make the DAST scanners run faster by not running the checks that you're already doing. Oh, and here's what I'm trying to get to be able to do at OWASP. I want to take project repos, pull code out to Jenkins, push those, or launch Dockers based on the code that I'm pulling, use something like Zap or other tools, also in a Docker to test them, take those results, push those findings into Defect Dojo, which will be the source of truth, and then from there, I can do fun things like push notifications to Slack if the project has a Slack channel, or push uh, validated findings into Jira, or if they use GitHub, GitHub issues, wherever they need them. So this is something I'm trying to get done at OWASP. I haven't made as much progress as I wanted to, in all honesty. Um, but that's where I'm heading, because I think that would be, one, I think it'd be really cool. Two, we're using our own tools to test ourselves, which I think is really hilarious. I don't know if you remember OWASP Horizon was a Java static analyzer. I pulled that down um, and talked to Paulo, and I said, hey, have you ever said I found a bug with your, with your Horizon? And he said, really, what'd you do? And I said, well, I downloaded Horizon, and I compiled it, and I ran it against itself. <laughs> said, Sorry, you wrote a Java tool to test Java. I'm going to run it against itself. And just a quick word, Defect Dojo had a, uh, woo, I'm going to move a little faster. Defect jo Dojo had a talk yesterday. If you didn't go to it, you should check it out. It's an OWASP project. It's fantastic. It's a great single source of truth. And it's gotten a lot of uh, velocity. And then evolving apps look faster. Oh, what went, oh my goodness, I'm still far ahead. I need to go faster. I've been rapping too long. So what went hand in hand with railroads? Well, that was a telegraph, right? Telegraph, right, was a way to speed up signaling. Now you had fast travel. You also had fast communication. Um, and it used the common language, Morse code, right, to transmit those messages. Right, let's look at automation, right? It enhances the benefit of an existing pipeline. It follows the same path, i.e. it's consistent because it's following a bit of written code, so there's no human interaction there. And it follows the standard protocol, REST and HTTP. Oh, and please, my little cry out to everybody, if you talk to a security vendor today or ever, ask them to please have a sane REST interface for their tool. I will no longer look at tools that don't have sane REST interfaces because I can't automate them and it's a pain. If you can't automate them, they're not in my pipeline, why do I have them? So please poke the vendors. Ah, here we go. Chat ops. Yeah, so um, I'd be curious, is anybody doing, like, hooking up security tools to chat? Uh, maybe would. Yeah. So yeah, two, okay. uh, two or three. So I, I enjoy trying to hook up uh, tools to, to Slack or, or chat or whatever because um, I, I think of it as a, a much easier way than just firing up those tools. Plus, I'm finding the order I get, I get them late here. <laughs> so I don't know if that's good or bad, but I'm trying to work smarter, really. Um, and, and so, you know, here's one. I actually, um, what, I, what I did is I actually kicked off the uh, uh, scan um, using chat, and then the, the WAP, the WAP, or actually the next channel, what do you want to call it, comes back in and says, hey, look, you're being attacked. And that's all just being done through chat. And, and you know, I, I think that is really where we need to go. Um, when, when I look at trying to engage my developers, I, I keep saying making it frictionless as possible because they've got a lot on their plate. Um, even when I'm trying to do development and I should think about doing security, I'm like, you know, security is a pain to do sometimes, it, right? We have to admit this, right? It is it, a pain to do, right? And especially when you want to just put out some features and then you're going to be spending more time doing it correctly, which is the right way to do it. But I want to make it as easy as I can for them. And, and even just an example here, um, how many have gone this way, right? So you go into an organization and you find out, hey, look, they've got a, they've got a, a net five just to pick, right, uh, as their web. And then, then, then you look and see, well, is it enabled? Is it actually doing anything? And you find out that it was a little too hard to get into and then, and, and actually, it is, this is a true life story, uh, that I look and see that they have mod security. And I'm like, oh, OK. Well, let's see, that's something. I like mod security. No, it's good. It was cool like 10 years ago. Um, just kidding. 
Uh, and, and so, but then I look and see, oh no, that's not enabled as well, right? And why aren't these tools being used? Is because they, obviously, their false positive rates are too high. Um, and, you know, and maybe you guys have gone through this sort of thing. And so, you know, looking at a better way to signal exactly what you're looking for, then that tool becomes accepted, especially if ops can see that they have a benefit from it. I think that's the other point is when security True. tools have operational benefits, it's such a much easier sell. And I'm going through this right now where it's like I'm trying to sell them on additional security tools, but they get a lot of operational benefit out of it in insight that they didn't normally have. Yeah, and this, this is somebody poking at the www.oas.org and getting banned for 24 hours, which happens all the time. And I just get a little, there's, if you go to our, our public Slack, you can go to the infrastructure, infrastructure blocked IPs and watch them scroll by. It's amazing how many people like fire up Doorbuster at www.os.org. Like, come on, really? <laughs> um, and then, then this is an idea. I had so so responses with it. And um, you know, I, I, here's the thing is, like, I experiment uh, quite a bit, right? Where I try different things, see if it works. And uh, I can't say that this was like super, like everybody used it, but I was just trying a different way, rather than having a stale wiki that you know, nobody looked at, I thought, well, could I put it in the chat? And can we have like chat ops where you can just say, hey, look, I'm doing a success, what why would you recommend? And then boom, there it is. Even if I'm the only one that uses it and say, I can just, just add tag the, the developer and say, well, here's, here, here's our library, here's a way to point to it, versus just static stuff wikis that nobody ever knows. Well, the thing I liked about this is we did this at Pearson, and we were all over the globe. You know, all around the world, different developers everywhere. And I like to sleep. And so if my time, 3 a.m., you want to ask me about cross-site scripting, well, you can ask the bot, because it's not sleeping. And at least get some rudimentary information until I'm back in the office, yeah. which was nice. Same with static analysis. Um, I don't like to configure static analysis jobs. Just like talking about you know, automating the things that are boring and the things that we don't want to do. I do not want to be setting up static analysis jobs or any kind of configuration job if I've got all the information. If you know where it is in GitHub, like why should you have to do all this stuff? Uh, so that, that there command, that command, and I think in, in further iterations it made it easier, uh, where you could just say, hey, look, we want to scan this repo and it's going to create a project that's going to add it to our source of truth and it's going to set up where it needs to go in JIRA, right? Those, those are things that we can all do through chat ops. Uh, so really, I, I kind of, I looked at it as my command line, which is actually in chat, is, is the way that we looked at it. Uh, then the, the other idea I had, uh, and, and it was, and it's always interesting how as application security uh, professionals, we, we, we sort of, we sort of find like-mindedness because when we talk about scaling with Docker's, there's some folks that I think at Cisco. Um, yep. Oh, they're doing the same thing. With a nice proof of concept tool that scaled using uh, Docker containers. And so I've experimented with this. I can't say that I have anything that I can show you that's really ready to release yet. Um, but the, the idea there was, you know, you've got some really good tools that are there configured. I don't want to have to go and find out how to compile certain programs. Let's face it, like a lot of our command line security tools are just a pain in the neck. To install, to yes. install, and then they've got all these libraries. There's other people, I don't want to be DTA that, for one thing. Um, so we, we would just you know, you use Kali and then, uh, okay, Nick2, okay, it's kind of late, but it's still fine. Cool stuff, Nick2. It's true, right? Sadly. Yeah. <laughs> Sadly. <laughs> Sadly. And this is just a lame example, but uh, of just, hey, let's just run Docker and then um, and you can get a good scaling with that, you know, and then it just pumps the results back in. You can pretty much, you know, run any sort of security tool against whatever. Uh, and there's just another example where we were launching security tools, um, having it kick off Zap in uh, headless mode, uh, and then it would um, push results to S3. S3 would then uh, we would ingest those results that way. So, like I said, there's a, a lots of different ways to do it, and I have to say that I mean there's some ideas that I had, and I know Matt was this as well that we tried. It's like that didn't work well at all. Right? <laughs> those and, didn't make the deck, by the right? way. And, and we can admit, like. <laughs> Mistakes and some things didn't work as awesome as we thought they would, um, but we scrapped it and then we moved. You know, we learned things from that and yep. then we made it better for the next generation. Um, and so I guess that would be my my takeaway for this is you know just keep experimenting on this and keep iterating through it because your developers are doing the same thing. I mean, like how many JavaScript frameworks are out there, right? <laughs> <laughs> They're always looking for something better, and so are we. And we have to keep that. We you know I think maybe there's a mentality of we set the tool and it's done now. 
that's not always the case. Yeah, you know, you have to iterate all the time. And half of the fact that we had our pipeline going well let us do these fun chat ops things. Because we already laid the way for, in our case, our static tool to dump it into our, uh, our uh, vulnerability management database, so that was there. And so now it was just API. a matter of. So we yeah. already had our API yep. there, so it was. Made it easy. Query. Yeah. Oh, well, we kind of said all this stuff already. It does effectively scale. You can obviously run tools anywhere, and deployment is silly easy with Docker. But you guys know that if you play with Docker. Yeah. We're tight on time a bit, so. Yeah, we'll just jump through those. We, oh, yeah, go ahead. Oh, uh, no, this is just a you know, different way uh, of, of going through it. You have Jenkins, and you can obviously take your security tests. You know, and, and you can do it in different ways. Um, and this is also obviously then calling out to our um, security tool sets that we created, our API. One of the security suites. So. Uh, same sort of thing is, is taking the, the pipeline as code approach, right? So, you know, integrate your security test, say, hey, look, here's a developer, you want to do some security tests, just throw in this little bit of code here, and now you've added security to your, your release. This is the way to start. Yeah, you know, and then conduct your own pipeline experiment. So this is sort of my call it if you want to get, if you want to, as I say, come down out of the traditional AppSec trees, using my evolutionary theme again, right? To do AppSec well, I really think you have to write code. I don't care what language it is. I don't care how nice the code is. I don't care if it's really crappy code. I've written loads of really crappy code. You just have to write code one so you understand the travails of developers. If you've never been a developer, you should at least bust your knuckles a few times and spend a day finding a semicolon and realizing there may be better things to do with your life. But like, we've all been there, and if you haven't, you should, because then you can tell that war story when you're around a bunch of devs, and they kind of go, oh, it's another brother who fought a day for a stupid character, right? Um, but you really should do that. And like I said, I don't care what language, just program something. The other thing is, most of the stuff we've talked about today with pipelines is glue code. It doesn't have to be production-ready, multi-threaded, mutexes, yada, yada, none of that. Like, simple, simple glue code. I'm going to pull in from this, I'm going to munge the data, I'm going to send it to that. Um, so don't worry about having to do these ultra elite sophisticated algorithm yada yada yada. Simple, simple glue code. Most of the stuff we wrote is in under 200 lines. Yeah. yeah, just simple little things to get you through. I'd say one thing that really helped me is that uh, I had started out as a developer and then I, I um, obviously went to have a piece of security and then you find yourself doing pen tests and you find yourself doing all those kinds of things. What, what helped me get back into it was that I actually did a Travis integration at a security test added on functional tests, all those types of things that you want in a, in a CICD pipeline. And then it made me think, oh wow, so these are all the things that my developers are contending with. And, and it's not just me talking and saying, hey look, you, know, you should do this. I've done it and I feel I feel your pain in a way, but I also see that, you know, how can you make good suggestions for security in the DevOps pipeline if you don't know how a CICD pipeline works? Yeah, absolutely, right. absolutely. And, and I'll just say too, I had to get over my embarrassment of, write some blue code and some of it's you know a little embarrassing but yeah I committed to GitHub you make fun of it if you want but get the for me it was like getting over that hurdle of you know I'm gonna push it out there and then you know somebody might not use it but it might spark an idea of saying hey you know I can make that better for you yep. and that's exactly what we've seen especially with Deepak Dojo is we can see other people and folks contribute and then iterate off of that and do some things that we never even thought about which is really which has been fantastic yeah um, quickly, I'm going to run through some case studies very fast because we're short on time and I want to make sure we get to the last bit. Um, AppSec Pipeline Company 1, they took security findings, turned them into tests, much like I spoke about earlier about weaponizing Jenkins. They added those tests, like I said, to Jenkins. They ran them regularly. They turned green when they were fixed. They tied alerts and chat ops to those fixes. And they had thir two FDEs that were able to assess 35 apps in one year. So that's pretty good if you think about a normal sort of pen test window. And the fact that they couldn't get regressions on existing issues because they wrote tests for them. Because you don't ever turn those off, they just are always green, right? So no big deal, let them run, and if, if they do actually ever go back to red, you've had a regression, you can find that stuff out. Uh, the other one was company two. Uh, in 2014, they did 44 assessments. Uh, in 2015, they did over 200. Um, and the reason the over 200 isn't known is because they didn't start counting until March. Um, so they're kind of a little bit of guess there. But they did create a pipeline that launched in March. They lost a couple of FTEs during that year, but still made speed improvements. What um, was the app they lost? Huh? Did you have an app or 
You got a, oh, what, what? Oh, yeah, well, half. Well, yeah, somebody got half assigned. I know, we, we cut somebody in half. It was, yeah, it was a mess. No, uh, anyway, yeah, sorry. Uh, the following year, they went from 200 to 414, which is a, uh, what, 2x improvement, roughly speaking. Um, and they also lost even more people. Um, and the people weren't backfilled because everybody knows how easy it is to find AppSec people. So overall, if you look at it, oh, it cut off the slide. It's a 9.4 uh, increase from 2014 to 2016 by doing this pipeline. And it took about three months of meta work, so to speak, to get the pipeline in place. But once it was in place, those speed improvements just kept coming. It was, it was really surprising. Uh, but I will say with that too, it made it very easy to add another person into it. It's not like it was yep. like they had to learn a whole lot of things. It was like, oh, here's your job. It's fairly well defined. That's true. And That's a huge point. Back into the, right, or I don't code yet, so I can look at false positives in the yeah. knowledge repository, absolutely. Ah, so um, the, the idea with this is, and what I show Bruce, well, you know, here we are down at Disney, right? Um, but I, I have kids, and I, I've probably watched this more times than I care to say. Um, this is Finding <laughs> Nemo, and there's the nice Finding Nemo's, and all that kind of thing. But I relate, I relate with Bruce, uh, maybe you, you will too after this, um, he, he would say this, right, I'm a nice shark, not a mindless eating machine, if I am to change a sandwich, I must change myself, as your friends, not food. I've, I've heard this like a gazillion times. Does anybody have kids? Yeah, all right. Everybody, everybody should know this okay. one. So uh, I was thinking about that, and I was like, oh yeah, this is Apple, this is security. Right after like the 50th time of watching it, you know, you're, you, you start to come up with crazy analogies. And so uh, I, I, I thought of this, it says, I'm a nice security professional, not a mindless vulnerability speeding machine, if I am to change a sandwich. I must first change myself, developers and friends, not fools. <laughs> um, and I think sometimes that's a mentality that we get into. Honestly, we could probably think of somebody in the, the, maybe we even work with right now that is that grumpy security person that developers don't want to work with. <laughs> Hopefully it's not you, right? And maybe it was you. You can recover. I say there's, there's hope, right? Um, so just think of that, and um, I, you know, I, I trademarked it for Sec DevOps. Just kidding, but uh, <laughs> it really you have to add Sec DevOps to everything, right? Uh, and, and that's it.